I'll start by saying that nothing could have prepared me for what I was going to discover the morning after a night out. It started as every other night would. Me and my family got ready to head to our local bar for a fundraising event. I just turned 18 and was looking to have a chill night with friends and family. I knew most of the people there, so I was feeling really relaxed. While at the bar, I went to pay for my drink when the bartender told me it had already been paid for. When I went to see who had paid for it, I saw my cousin's partner. He's around 12 years older than me, give or take. I gave him a quick wave and we did the normal niceties like, Hi, how are you doing? It's important to note that I'd barely spoken more than two words to him before, as he was usually quiet, or retreated to his room when we would go and visit my cousin. After saying thank you, I thought nothing of it. Nothing seemed off with our little interaction. By the end of the night, I had gathered my family together and told them I wanted to head home. At this point in time, I was still living at home with my mother. She had made plans to stay at my grandmother's that night, so I was going to go home and sleep. It was around 11.30pm, and I was outside having a smoke, about to head to my car. Just as I was about to head to my car, I hear someone call my name, so I turned to find my cousin's partner walking towards me. He asked if I was heading home for the night, which I thought was weird. I said it was late, so I was calling it a night. Without skipping a beat, he mentioned the car I drive and said he would see me around sometime. At this point I got a bit creeped out, so I said goodnight and walked off to my car. There were plenty of people outside, so I wasn't concerned at all. Once I got in the car, my phone went off and it was my mother. She was begging and pleading with me to go and stay at my grandmother's house for the night, saying that she had a really bad feeling. Initially, I was really annoyed. I just wanted to go home and go to sleep in my own bed, but she insisted. I couldn't understand why. I was used to being alone at home at night, but she wouldn't let it go. I hung up and started driving home. I couldn't be bothered going to my grandma's when my house was just down the road. I was tired. I just wanted to go home. Not even halfway home, my phone went off, so I pulled over to check it. It was my sister asking me to please go stay at my grandma's house. I was pissed off at this point and decided it would be easier going to my grandma's house instead of arguing with my family. When I got to my grandma's house, everyone was asleep. Now I was really pissed off and went straight to sleep. The night was uneventful, but I woke up in the morning to my family talking about how they all had a feeling of dread, which is why they didn't want me to go home alone that night. My mother and I left for home at lunch. I felt off as soon as we pulled into the driveway. Once I got to the door, I found a police card wedged into the door to call them ASAP. I went inside and found my mother's camera on the kitchen table. This was a huge red flag as it was in my bedroom before we left for the fundraiser. I went to my room to find my entire room had been ransacked. No other room in our house had been touched. My blankets had been pulled back, and it looked like someone had been in my bed. My underwear drawer was wide open, and some were also sprawled on the floor. Another camera of my mother's was also on the table where my TV was, which was directly opposite my bed. My clothes were everywhere. By this point, I was losing my shit. If I'd gone home, like the plan all along, I would have made my way through the house and then crawled into bed without switching my lamp on. I had done this so many times previously, and I wouldn't have seen the state of my room at all. My mother gave them a call to find out what happened, and what she told me made the blood drain from my face. The police were alerted to a break-in at our next-door neighbor's house, when our neighbors found a man wandering inside their house. The man claimed he was my friend and went into the wrong house, and they chased him out. Our house had a big 8x12 meter deck, which looked over my neighbor's house. They called the police again when they spotted the man having a smoke on our deck. The police arrived at our house at 2am, but since I wasn't home, no one answered the door. They noticed the lights were on, so they went inside to investigate. They made their way through the house and found a man hiding in my bedroom in the dark. 
He couldn't give an answer why he was there or why he was hiding in my room. They had arrested him and taken him to the station and wanted to know if we knew him. And it turns out that it was my cousin's partner and he'd been hiding in my room for over an hour waiting for me to get home because he knew I would be going home that night. My mother's gut feeling saved me from going home alone that night, and my neighbor's vigilance helped to catch a creep. I always listen now without question whenever she has a bad feeling. Who knows what would have happened? All I know is it wouldn't have been pretty. He was charged with breaking and entering and spent some time in jail before being released and moving country. Always trust your mother's gut feeling, people. It sure saved me from having to deal with that. It has been a while since I last posted a story about a suicide house, but I've had several requests for more stories about my experiences in the field of trauma scene work. If you don't know what that is, I used to lead a crew that would go in after a murder, suicide, unattended death, accidental death, fire death, or any manner of incident that caused damage to a structure that left behind a scene that the victim's family shouldn't have to see. Now I know my stories are not scary in the haunted or serial killer type stories, but the fact is, most people couldn't handle walking into a scene like many of the ones I've been on. We've actually had to be careful how we train crew members who work on such scenes. It was often a volunteer basis for working on those types of scenes, meaning we didn't force anyone to go to a house where the dad killed all the children before blowing his brains out in the Lazy Boy. We just didn't start someone in training and then go, Oh, and by the way, we're going to a multiple homicide. Anyway... If there was a way to describe some of the sights and smells of doing this type of work, I'm sure you would see how truly scary or messed up this all is. First of all, I have to say that suicide is not glamour, nor is it ever over for those around you. If you need help, please get help. Don't let your loved ones find you that way. It not only changes them, but changes the feeling inside the house. Anyway, back to my story. This took place in the late 1990s, just before I got out of the field. We got a call to dispatch a crew out to a house, and we were told that there was an incident with at least one death. Sometimes it's given to us that way, but never like a real whole story, but sometimes we saw the true story on the evening news, or even a neighbor that talks too much. We arrive at this house. It's a modest house, but not really a high-end home. It's not quite a low-end one either. It was a two-story home about midway into a cul-de-sac street. As with some scenes, there's a cluster of neighbors outside looking at who we were and why we were there. The sheriff's department had just released the scene, so all of the crime scene investigators had already done their job. As I approached the house, I noticed a ton of what looked like bullet holes in the stucco, broken glass, and a long blood stain on the driveway. We went inside and had to suit up almost immediately, as the police had probably used tear gas. There were bloodstains all over. It looked like as if someone had been dragged through the house with blood gushing. There were areas that had pulled up blood. There were areas where it kind of looked like explosions had happened, to which I assumed flashbangs were used, or maybe the guy inside had shot up. What probably strikes you the most in situations like this is how benign the underneath looks. I don't know how to describe it, but just imagine, if you will, a place looking like the inside of a home, molded out of a TV set of Full House. Now imagine the same TV set with blood smeared and pooled, bullet holes and tons of broken glass. I mean, they seem like a very normal family. I remember in their living room a big blue woodcut sign that said, Family. You know, before live, laugh, love signs were in style. And under that sign were a bunch of family photos of kids, parents, Christmas, graduations and vacations. 
For other things in the house was a wall dedicated to the dad's love of his sports teams and pictures of him with his buddies at games and stuff. So, what happened? From what we pieced together from the news reports, neighbors who wanted to talk to us while we were cleaning his blood off the driveway and from the scene itself was that the dad went crazy. He'd been talking about demons. Not like I got my own demons, but actual demons. He was sure that he was being attacked by the devil and that demons were trying to take the souls of his family. So rather than to let the demons take his family, he killed them so they would go to heaven. He ended up barricading himself in the house. It looked like some family members tried to get away after being shot and stabbed, but one collapsed in the kitchen, and one escaped somehow and was pulled out by police. The guy ended up shooting back at the police, and the neighborhood was evacuated for blocks. I can't say that all happened for sure, due to the fact that we arrived on the scene much later, but that was what the people outside were saying. In the end, he escaped the house and ended up on the roof still shooting at the police. They shot him down and he fell from the roof, and that was his blood we were cleaning from the driveway. He murdered his wife. One of his older children later died in the hospital. One of the kids was killed inside the house. One escaped, and I think another family member that lived with them was unharmed, as they were not at the house when this all went down. It took us a lot longer to clean this scene, as there were so many holes, and we had to remove almost all of the carpet and soft surfaces due to the tear gas. It was a terrible scene inside. I know this might sound religious or whatever, but come across enough of these scenes, and you start to really believe evil does exist. It was April 2020, and we were in the thick of the pandemic. Everything was shut down, and the only human interaction available was social media. I began getting following requests on Instagram more frequently, and chalked this up to boredom from sitting at home all day. I received a request from a guy who appeared to know a close friend of mine, at least from what he told me when he DM'd me. I accepted the request and began answering his messages. We talked about the current climate of the world, what we were watching on Netflix, and that kind of stuff. Nothing abnormal. He had a tendency to send me a lot of DMs at once, which was a bit overwhelming. But again, I chalked it up to the lack of contact from the pandemic. Anyways, as time went on, I began to feel like this man was getting a little too intrusive with his messages, mainly with the growing obsession he began to show. He consistently talked about how perfect I was, and that when I posted videos, he felt like I was talking to him and only him. He said my eyes pierced his soul. Naturally, this freaked me out. I asked my friend what his deal was. She told me she had no idea who he was, and that he was just a random follower of hers. So the story he told me about knowing her was fabricated. A year passed by, and he's still sending hundreds of DMs, including voice memos and songs he'd make up about me. He would also regularly talk about how he'd take me shopping and out to eat, when we met in person, even though I'd tell him I didn't want to meet him. At one point, he kept repeating this cryptic message about kissing stars, which I later realized he was referring to a tattoo that I have on my upper right thigh. He was trying to tell me he'd kiss my upper thigh when he got the chance to meet me. I expressed disgust, which aggravated him. He seemed to not like the fact that I was openly repulsed by him, which should have made him go away, but I think he liked the chase of trying to change my mind. I'd block him, but then he'd message me on another social media platform. He was not letting up. I tried being polite, and I tried ignoring him. I tried being rude. Nothing was working. Then, after I posted a short story time with a couple of weird voice memos he'd sent me, he somehow found the post. I did not include any of his information in the video, but he found it somehow, and he sent me my address to tell me to take the video down. 
I did immediately. He began to ramble about how he would never hurt me, and this was just to grab my attention. It was very creepy. The creepiest of all, though, was when he sent me 101 voice messages describing in disgusting detail how he would stand behind me while whispering in my ear and grace his lips across my neck and I'd receive his touch. I literally felt sick to my stomach. I didn't listen to all of them because it made me physically ill. Fortunately, since the last time I blocked him, he has not tried to reach out again. At least to my knowledge, I don't understand how someone could become so obsessed, yet never meet in person. In 2010, my hometown was shaken by disappearances. First, there were small children missing, a new report every week. In the same month, a woman disappeared too, and people started speculating that it could be organ trafficking related. Everybody talked about a black Jeep SUV spotted in the days of the disappearances. My mom was working late in the center of the city, so I went to see her one evening. I stayed until about 10 p.m. and decided to walk home despite her pointing out the danger in the city, but I was determined to have a walk and assured her it was safe that people were all around the streets at that time. Other than the bus station where I saw a few taxis, there wasn't a living soul in front of me or passing cars. No noise except for the river. And I had to pass a bridge then after about 100 meters on the left of my street just a couple of minutes walk to my home. As I walked on the bridge, I saw a black SUV jeep parked in front of me on the corner of the street, on the street I had to pass. The second I saw it, the lights went off. I couldn't hear the engine at the distance, but I'm certain they shut the engine off so I wouldn't notice them and walk by. But, without hesitating, I just turned around and continued to walk back fast. When I started to pass the bus station street, with the taxis right in front of me, I slowed down to check, and the SUV was driving parallel to my walking. I watched the black glass until it sped off, and I waited for a bit before sprinting home. Maybe a week later, I was on the phone with my boyfriend walking home, and again it wasn't late. As I passed the spot where the SUV was parked previously, I decided to pass my street on the right side because there were houses I could easily approach, just in case. As I was passing my street, I heard a car the second I was stepping on the right side, still on the phone with my boyfriend. The car pulled over on the sidewalk. I ran in the front yard of the first house. A man got out of the back door of the car and started approaching me. I was telling my boyfriend what was happening and went closer to the front door of the house. The man started yelling something at me in Albanian dialect and finally got back in the car and they sped off. There were four men in that car. For some backstory before the main part, I smoke weed. I'd smoked for a while mostly for recreational use, but also partly because I have some insomnia, and it helps with that. The only downside being it made me a bit paranoid, which was never a problem until I switched to vaping my THC. While vaping was much better and easier, I also started to get way more paranoid. Paranoid to the point that I thought there was someone else living in my house, and had even strategically hidden several of my kitchen knives around my place. In case of a break-in, my weed-addled mind concluded. And for those logical people thinking, why didn't you just stop smoking? Well, I was weak and had grown dependent on it. I just couldn't stop. I then had to go buy replacements to use in the actual kitchen because I was high a lot those days, and therefore paranoid a lot, and decided to leave the knives hidden around. I went and bought like four more, and one large chopping-style knife, with an orange rubber cover on the blade. 
which is important for later, because after unpacking my items at home, I had the strangest compulsion, and rather than put the orange knife away, I stuck it into my purse. After a time, the knife became at home at the bottom of my bag. It felt the same as loose receipts, tissues, anything I had in there just adding to the miscellaneous bag junk I never questioned. Now for the really crazy part of the story. One day I had finished my shift at work and had gone outside to get my dose vaping before my short walk home. I then popped in some eye drops and went to grab my stuff, but before I could leave, my manager told me my co-worker had flaked on cleanup and I had to stay to fill in for him and lock up. Needless to say, I wasn't in the right mindset to argue and it took way longer to clean and lock up than it should have, mostly because my manager flaked on me as well and I kept getting distracted. When I left, it was pretty late. I was sober, though not much, and made the poor choice of going the 10 to 15 minute walk home rather than pay for a ride, and the even worse choice of taking a few vape hits before I set off. That's where the real story starts. The streets were a lot quieter the further I got from work, and the paranoia started to set in. I was glancing around lots, and that's when I noticed him. There was a man on the other side of the street who'd come around the corner. He was in dark clothes with a big jacket and cap on, despite it being dark out. My hackles were already raised at this point, and all my paranoid energy was hyper-focused on him. So when he crossed the street to walk behind me, I was instantly on edge. I couldn't relax with him behind me. I had a terrible feeling so I crossed over to walk on the other side of the street. Now, you can only imagine my horror when rather than stay on his side, he crossed over with me. My brain immediately pulled a red card on that move. Alarm bells were going off, but I wasn't sure I wasn't imagining things in my semi-high state. So what did I do? I crossed the street again like an idiot and then proceeded to silently lose my shit when he followed me. I panicked knowing I'd probably given myself away that I knew he was following me. There was no one close to help me. I was alone on a dark street with this creeper who wanted God knows what from me, and I was unarmed. Except you're not, the thought popped into my head. I remembered I'd had that big orange-covered knife in my bag. My bag was wrapped over my shoulder in front of me, so he couldn't really see me open it and shakily rummage around for the knife. I cannot describe the small rush of relief I felt when I had it in my hand, even more so when I took the cover off, and it glinted back at me. When I looked back, the man was a lot closer and walking quickly towards me. I froze and stopped walking. He looked spindly as hell, and I thought I couldn't outrun him. So instead, I turned around to face him in what was both the stupidest and bravest moment of my life. He seemed surprised by that, but only when he saw the knife in my hand did he stop approaching me. We both just stood there, staring at each other. I couldn't really see his face from the shadow the cap cast on it, so I had no idea what he was thinking. I was a barely composed mess, but I felt the strangest confidence radiating from the big-ass knife in my hand, while his hands were empty. It was the same confidence mixed with my high brain and a nagging feeling that made me step forward. I was stiff and terrified, but my body started moving on its own, and I started to walk towards him, staring straight at him. He didn't move an inch, but as I got closer and closer, he finally shifted his weight and slid a foot back. That little movement must have triggered some long-dead predator bullshit instinct in my lizard brain, because suddenly my gut screamed at me to rush at him, and so that's what I did. I broke out into a run straight at him, and he nearly fell over his feet, turning around. I got so close to him, I could have touched the back of his coat, but instead swiped downwards with a knife that I didn't even remember raising. It slipped across the fabric, but snagged on the hem for just a second. It would have fallen out of my hand if not for my death grip. He must have felt it, because in the next second... He was bolting down the pavement like a man truly running for his life, and I, for whatever reason, ran right after him. 
He very easily outpaced me, but I didn't stop, and when he made the mistake of looking back with what I imagined was a horrified expression, he stumbled slightly. I think he might have rolled his ankle or something, because he was suddenly much slower with an odd run. There was so much adrenaline pouring through me, I didn't feel afraid anymore. I felt so alive, I even felt a sadistic sort of pleasure, watching him scrambling to get away from me. I think I might have laughed out loud. It all came to a stop when my sane brain finally asked me, what will you do if you catch him? Now that thought immediately shut me down, and I stopped running after him. I watched as he raced off and disappeared around a bend while I panted. I was bent over, hands on my knees trying to catch my breath, trying to understand what just happened. Was I still so high I just imagined it? Did I just really run after a man with a knife? What would I have done if I'd caught up to him? The adrenaline rush quickly just turned into sheer panic and disbelief. I started shaking like a leaf and realized I was still holding the knife. I threw it into my bag, turned around, and started to run again. I ran until my lungs burned and my whole body ached, and then I just painfully jogged and walked until I finally made it home locking my door behind me. I dragged myself to the kitchen, pulled water out of the fridge, and collapsed on the cold floor. I was shaking so much, most of the water ended up on my face, clothes, and all over the place. I may have also cried a bit. After sitting there for God knows how long, my mind running the scene over and over in my head, and all the terrible ways it could have gone wrong, I finally came to a conclusion that I was lucky as fuck to have made it home, and that I was going to stop vaping since I had no damn control over myself. Sure, my paranoia made me notice him sooner and had me prepared with a knife, but it made me an easy target. It could have gone so, so much worse. It was my bad decision making when high that let me think it was a good idea to walk home so late. I eventually got off the floor and went to my room and flushed my vape juice down the toilet. I went back into the kitchen and took the knife out of my purse. It had jostled when I ran and tore up the inside of my bag a bit. I was both relieved and weirdly disappointed it didn't have any blood on it, but I shoved that feeling deep down. I considered throwing it away, but after it saved my life, that just felt cruel. So I put the orange cover on it and left it on the countertop before taking an hour-long shower, crying a ton more, and then crawling into bed. So yeah, essentially this is the crazy story about how I quit weed and terrified myself for months afterwards. But now, when I look back, no matter how terrifying it was for me, I can chuckle a bit and hope it was even worse for that creep. I hope the image of me running after him with a knife still scares him to this day. Oh, and I still have the orange kitchen knife in one of my bags. I live in a little suburban area on the outskirts of a city. My apartment is on the ground floor and faces into a cul-de-sac with a car park. Recently, I've been hearing a lot of cat-related kerfuffle from the area. I didn't think much of it at first. There are plenty of cats, pets, and strays in the area. They fight. They screw. All that stuff. I'm well used to the kinds of unearthly noises cats can make. They can be pretty freaky, especially when you wake up in the darkest hours of pre-dawn to them. Anyway... I'd been hearing this one particular cat, I thought, for several days, and it always sounded like it was coming from the car park. I know we, as humans, tend to anthropomorphize these things, but it was a sad little cry. After a while, I started to think that maybe this was a pet that was lost or hurt. Maybe it had been beaten up by one of the big strays in the area. The old heartstrings started to pull every time I heard it, but I couldn't spot the little guy anywhere. 
I thought about trying to put out some tin fish or something, but there are so many other cats that I had no guarantee that this one would benefit from it. The next time I heard it, I decided to go take a more thorough look. It was about 10pm and it was freezing cold, but out I went into the car park, looking around the bins and checking under cars. The cat stopped crying as soon as I opened the door, but I guess it must have heard a person and clammed up out of fear. I got about halfway across the space, when a street light, right at the center of the cul-de-sac, the only one that lights up the space, went out. Now, that's pretty weird. The street light isn't motion activated or anything. It's time to come on at night and turn off during the day. It stays on all night. I've never seen it randomly turn off before. Alright, weird electrical fault. I turn back to my apartment. Fortunately, the motion-activated light above my door that turned on when I stepped out is still aglow, so it's not like I've been plunged into total darkness. Except that one turns off too, pretty much as soon as I turn around. Huh, <laughs> what a coincidence of timing, I say to myself, trying to ignore the growing sense of unease. What do I have to be nervous of? I'm standing in a car park in a cul-de-sac, not the middle of the woods or something, but it's surprisingly dark out there without those lights. Fine, I'll just trigger my light again by moving around, and the damn thing wakes me up all the time because it's too sensitive. It picks up cars and people as soon as they enter the cul-de-sac, except now it's not working. I wave my arms, move closer, nothing triggers it two weird electrical faults in a row. Not impossible, right? But I can't help but feel creeped out by it. Now the cat, that's been silent since I stepped outside, starts crying again. Except it's not just one cat. The crying is coming from several places at once, and started almost at the same time. There've got to be at least three or four different cats, screaming loud from different parts of the car park. I can't see any of them. It's just their weird alien voices. Enough is enough. I go back into my apartment. I'm not going out to investigate if I hear it again. It's not a paranormal event for sure, just a series of creepy coincidences. But still, it weirded me out. For context, I live in the USA, in a pretty well-populated apartment complex, with my building right across the parking lot from the leasing office and the tennis court. About five years ago, the office installed some fencing on the far side of the tennis court to be used as a dog park. On the other side of the dog park is just a big empty field that borders with a different apartment complex, maybe 20 yards away. Okay. So I recently adopted a dog. She's an older pup who alternates between sleeping for hours and being so hyperactive that she spins in circles just to entertain herself. I take her on walks three times a day and we always go to the park. I adopted a dog pretty recently, so I've been making use of the dog park pretty regularly. She absolutely loves running around the park so we usually spend about 15 to 20 minutes there before going home. Now, I have an unusual schedule, so our last walk doesn't happen until 2am. This has never been a problem for us, until lockdown happened and my state issued a shelter-in-place order. As a result, the lights that used to illuminate the tennis court and dog park have been shut off. I still took my dog to the park and I brought a flashlight along, one night, we finished our walk and went to the park like usual. My dog had been acting a bit strange, pulling hard on her leash and making grumbling sounds. But once we were in the park, she was running around like normal. However, as I was standing there, huddled in my coat with the hood up because it's cold and a bit rainy, 
My dog abruptly stopped dead. I figured she saw a rabbit or something in the field, so I turned on the flashlight to look around, and there, in the field, there's a man. He's pretty far off, but clearly walking towards us through the grass. I was a little spooked already because it's 2am, raining and freezing cold, but the man doesn't seem to be wearing a coat or hat. I immediately decide it's time to leave. I went down the length of the park to grab my dog. I hooked on her leash and jogged to the gate to leave. Once we left the park, my dog went ballistic, barking wildly and yanking so hard on her leash that she was choking herself. I turned and could barely make out the silhouette of the man bobbing up and down like he was running after us. I didn't even bother with the leash. I picked up my dog and ran for my building, terrified that she'd claw herself over my shoulder to try and get to the man. Once I got home, I bolted the door and wedged a chair under the knob. It was probably a dumb thing to do, but I felt safer knowing it was there. I curled up on the couch in my living room, watching the window and praying no one comes up, while my dog stood still in front of the door growling every time the wind blew or something shifted outside. I told my boyfriend and roommate what happened, but neither of them seemed as spooked about it as I was. I don't know what was up with that guy. I have so many questions about the whole incident, but I'm too scared to consider what might have happened if the guy had been closer to the park when my dog noticed him. Or maybe I'm just paranoid and he was coming over to say hi at 2 a.m. in the freezing rain during the lockdown. Anyway, I'm scared to go out alone at night, so my boyfriend goes with me to walk the dog. We haven't seen the guy since, but I can't shake off the deep sense of unease that crawls up my spine whenever I think back on it. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.